I, I make films. That way I express myself. If my expression is alienated, so what? At least I'm expressing myself as free as possible. I don't want to talk about myself anymore. I already said too much. Everyone knows I pay the consequences for my actions. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just want to say that we're all in danger. If this is your view of life, how do you plan to avoid the danger and the risk that you describe? It's late. Uh, we should stop. Uh, perhaps you could leave the questions with me. I think some of the points are flat. I'd like to think about them. I feel much more comfortable writing than talking like this. I can make some notes and get them to you tomorrow. Do you have a title? What about We're All in Danger? And that's a clip from Pasolini, and I'm delighted to say we've been joined by Willem Dafoe, who is Pasolini. Willem, hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks very much indeed for, for joining us. Tell us how you got involved with the movie. Well, I had worked with the director Abel Ferrara before, and um, basically we knew we wanted to make a film that had something to do with Pasolini. We didn't know exactly what. There was no script, so we kicked around some ideas, and... Uh, you know, this is uh, the result of a process uh, deciding how to frame our story and uh, make it. So what was it that made you think that you wanted to make a movie about Pasolini? What is it that you wanted to put over? Well, we both uh, live in Italy. Um, so uh, he's a, not just because of that, but he's, he's a particularly um, strong influence on us. Uh, he was really a prophet. Um, uh, we have great, both of us have great admiration for his work. And as a cultural figure, um, how he lived, how he died, uh, where he figured in Italian culture uh, is something very interesting and something that we can learn from uh, even today. So the film tells the story about his last couple of days. Why did you decide... If you're going to play Pasolini, if you're going to make a movie about Pasolini, why did you concentrate exclusively on, on, on that small window? Um, you've got to, you know, you've got to figure out how to, f you know, you've got to make a structure. And um, there's many ways you could uh, approach the, his life, his work. And uh, this was just sort of the most practical way for us. Um, we started interviewing family and friends, and um, we thought the best thing to do would be to make a very precise structure. And we uh, created a scenario that was really built from the details of those interviews. So we had sort of a factual or a documentary approach to making the structure, and then we uh, fleshed it out from there and just really tried to inhabit um, that scenario. And, and, and also be able to present some of his material and try to, uh, at least to our minds, uh, approximate where we imagined uh, he had arrived at a life that was cut short, where he was at. And cut short in a particularly brutal way because he's killed by a gang. I'm not sure if it's a burglary or if it's that they object to his homosexuality, but it is particularly brutal. In Italy, is this still discussed you know who killed Pasolini sometimes seems almost to be like who killed Kennedy it's exactly that um, it is still discussed and um, we really made a conscious choice to make sure that that wasn't what the movie is about because we do uh, deal with his last days that's certainly part of it and it's also uh, of course an ending um, uh, we didn't want to shy away from it but uh, one of the challenges was to tell that uh, part of the story without taking a clear, um, you know, expressing an opinion about actually what happened, to make the event without um, uh, kind of uh, showing our hand. Yeah. And while he's an iconic figure in Italy, my guess is he's not really an iconic figure in a lot of the rest of the world. You've already referred to him as a prophet. Could you just convince maybe a skeptical audience just to explain what it is about this man that that made you think he's a prophet and and is so extraordinary you know my way of convincing is to try to make the movie okay. and then people <laughs> take it from there but i get it um 
Well, why is he a prophet for me? Just the things that he was talking about, a certain kind of evolution of uh, Italian culture and, uh, and even Western culture. Uh, he was very prescient. Uh, he really saw uh, certain changes that were going to happen. And uh, he spoke to those things. And he was a very articulate um, guy. And he he always sort of defended and was interested in what was human, what was vital. So he railed against certain kind of education systems, certain kind of uh, uh, materialism, uh, uh, certain... Uh, kind of flattening out a certain kind of homogenization. He felt like people were losing their sense of self, their uh, their identity, their specificness, their humanness. Everybody wanted the same thing. And I think as I'm going into this litany of <laughs> his his thoughts, I think this all sounds very familiar. So what was the fight that he was fighting? Uh, to, to try to... Um, celebrate and find what's human. I mean, sometimes he, he was known very much for uh, uh, loving to hang out with very simple people. But here he was a very erudite, intellectual, uh, much accomplished in many fields, um, a very cultured guy. But uh, the people that he preferred, he said jokingly or not so jokingly in one interview, he preferred people uh, with less than a fourth grade education. Um, because he felt like they were more connected to their um, humanness, uh, what was vital. They were emotional. They weren't dead. They weren't in a lockstep um, that was dictated from uh, someone else. He made a very beautiful documentary in the 60s uh, interviewing people about sex, and one of my impressions from watching that was how, how people take their attitudes and their... Um, their uh, their attitudes and their tastes and their desires from someone else. They don't really take it from themselves. Is it true you didn't really know that much about Pasolini until Martin Scorsese recommended The Passion of Matthew Pryor to doing The Last Temptation of Christ? That's half true. I, I knew of him, um, but only I knew some films. But I didn't know... Uh, uh, about his critical writings. I didn't know his poetry until uh, my Italian wife turned me on to th those. I didn't know, I knew his novels existed, but I had not read them. But of course, all these things I, uh, through time, I did uh, become acquainted with. Mm -hmm. And and the fact that uh, Martin Scorsese told me to look at uh, Passion According to Matthew was very important. Because your movie, the Pasolini movie, starts with him editing one of his more controversial movies with some pretty grim scenes from Salo. But then it's worth remembering that The Passion According to Matthew is there, which is on the Vatican-approved list, one of their 50 top movies of all time. I mean, they don't, they don't obviously call it that, but effectively they're saying, go watch this movie. And it's true. It's true. Well, it um, it's, uh, it's a powerful movie and uh, sort of like Last Temptation. Uh, you know, it always amazes me that uh, the religious right took offense to that movie when it's a movie that really does address um, the spiritual matters. And I think you, you've made this, uh, this connection that in the same way that that was a Jesus and not the Jesus, I think you believe that this new movie is certainly a Pasolini, not the Pasolini. Certainly, certainly. It's, it's our Pasolini. It's what um, it was... Uh, our portrait from uh, our experience of him and our, our love for him and our admiration for him. And if someone comes out of your movie and wants to go and see something and go and start afresh and thinks, maybe I should go and look at this work, where should they go? What, what would you recommend? He's shot some beautiful movies, some not so beautiful maybe. His poetry is very beautiful. Get any collection of his poetry. Um, read uh, his poem about his mother. Uh, also, his critical writing. Uh, the thing that I came to uh, at the very last was his critical writing, particularly his late critical writing, uh, the Corsair writings and the Lutheran letters. Uh, 
this this is sort of included in some of the thoughts he, he expresses some of the thoughts that he uh, writes about in those letters in the last interview in the movie so if you see the movie and you really respond to that interview that's where to go I just have a few questions from uh, listeners just before you go Willem the last time you were on the show was for Antichrist so here's a question from uh, Brian Shano uh, who says do you agree with uh, Mark he's our uh, movie critic uh, do you agree with Mark's assertion that just because you were in Antichrist doesn't mean you understood it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, what's to understand? I mean, uh, a movie is a complex thing. People are going to have different understandings. They're going to have different reactions to it. Thank God. There's no uh, uh, one uh, interpretation. Jamie Britton's question next. Can you ask Willem how he managed to give one of the greatest performances I've ever seen in Paul Schrader's Affliction, despite being in it for about 10 minutes, barely moving, and acting opposite Nick Nolte? Hmm. That's very kind. Um, look, I like that material. Uh, that was a very beautiful uh, story, very beautiful novel by Russell Banks. Um, so I felt somehow connected it uh, to it. Not so much from my personal life, but it spoke to me. Um, thank you. <laughs> I had worked with Paul Schrader before. He had a very uh, simple, direct approach to it, and I think it suited the movie. Jeff Hannon's question: Where can I get Where can I get your jacket from Grand Budapest Hotel? <laughs> <laughs> that's That's a tough one. <laughs> that's a one of a kind, and I'm sure it's under lock and key somewhere. <laughs> David Proctor's question, finally, how bonkers was the set of Heaven's Gate? Ah, it didn't start out bonkers. Uh, you know, uh, it was it was interesting. And, uh, who knows what came first, the pressure from the studio, the panic from the studio, or uh, Michael Cimino's perfectionism. Um, but the two was sort of a bad mix when, uh, you know, after the first couple of days, we were a week behind that made the studio very nervous. And we know the rest of the story, but um, there was a lot of tension. Uh, there were a lot of uh, good intentions to make a very um, uncompromising, beautiful movie. Um, but people lost their nerve halfway through, and uh, some crazy stuff happened. Yeah. Willem, we appreciate your time today. Thank you very much indeed. What's, what's next for you after Pasolini? What are you working on next? I worked with Hector Babenco uh, in uh, Brazil in a movie called My Hindu Friend, and I just finished uh, a long time in China with Zhang Yimou on a, a big movie called uh, The Great Wall. So both of those should be coming out, uh, not soon, but uh, in the next year. Look forward to that. Willem Dafoe, we appreciate your time. Thank yeah, you. okay, Bye. be well.